Well, welcome once again to Table of Grace. My name is Chad. If I've not gotten the chance to meet you, I'll be in the back after, and I'd love to take the opportunity to meet you. And at the end of your rows, you have a black uh, worship pad. If you would, take the opportunity to fill that out. Pass it to your neighbor. Say hello if you've not done that yet. And uh, if you're a guest with us here today, if you want to share with us your, your phone, your email, uh, your address, whatever, whatever you're most comfortable with, then a member of our welcome team will be in contact with you this week to see if there's any questions we can answer for you. Well, we've been in this series called From Now On, as we've been looking at some very practical ways that we can follow Jesus, as we've been journeying through the Gospel of Luke, the story of Jesus that Luke tells us in our scriptures. And, and even if you're, you're here today for the very first time, and maybe you're not really, really sure what following Jesus looks like, or, or maybe you were a Christian from the moment you were born, you pretty much can't remember a time you haven't been at church, I believe that as we journey through this series that you'll find very practical ways that you too can become more like Jesus as we journey through this season called Lent, in which we prepare for Easter. Now, next week, we're going to look at one of my favorite stories in the scripture. As we look at this topic of from now on, we ask questions, and so I invite you to come back next week as we look at that. But today, we're going to be looking at uh, a couple of scriptures that are maybe very familiar to you. You've probably heard them, even if you've not been at church for a very long time, or, or maybe just in our culture, or maybe, you know, you kind of quote each other, you know, as friends. You're like, oh, well, how about this one? How about this one? I think these will be kind of familiar passages to you because I know that's what you do as you quote scripture to each other, uh, like trading cards. But uh, I think these would be very familiar to you. But the challenge with them is not that they're familiar. It's that they're very hard to put into practice. And so I think we'll have a lot of fun as we look at these in Luke chapter 6. And our topic today is that from now on, I will live by wisdom, not criticism. So Luke chapter 6, intrigued yet? Does that sound cool? All right. Leanne is. All right. So uh, Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 41, it says this. We'll also have it on the screens. Jesus is speaking, and he says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart." For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. And when a flood came and the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Now in this moment in Jesus' ministry, Jesus has has been healing and, and been teaching and and at this point he's called his disciples and he's come together and he's picked the twelve that will be his his inner circle. And then he really shares his first sermon. And in, God, in the Luke's gospel, we call this the Sermon on the Plain. And, and some of us may be familiar with, with the version in Matthew that's called the Sermon on the Mount. But in this one, this is much shorter. And so perhaps Luke edited down this first sermon of Jesus. And I can't imagine anyone wanting to edit a sermon for time or content or anything like that. But perhaps he did that uh, to kind of share this one. Or perhaps... This is a sermon that Jesus would give on multiple occasions as Jesus would travel around and he would teach to different groups that that he would give this sermon because it was a sermon in which Jesus was giving a vision of what life was like in the kingdom of God. That Jesus was saying, this is what this new community of people will be like, this people who live by faith, hope, and love. This is how you are to live and how you are to act and how you are to treat each other. Jesus has given a vision of the kingdom of God of God in this passage. And so it begins with these blessings and with these woes and 
And so, you know, Jesus would say, you know, blessed are the poor for theirs is the kingdom of God and blessed are those who are hungry for they will be fed. And then he says, blessed are those who weep and are sad because your mourning will be turned to joy. And then he says, woe to you who, who are happy because later you'll be sad. Jesus is kind of balancing these, these two ideas, those who, who have nothing and those who have everything and, and that these roles will be reversed. And then Jesus goes into this section in which he's, he's giving these sort of wisdom statements and the first one he gives, he talks about how we are to love our enemies and which he's kind of riffing on, on how we love our neighbor as ourself. And then he gets to this section in which he is sharing about how we are not to judge other people. And so he begins to share this. He says that, that who are you to put the, the speck of sawdust out of your neighbor's eye when you have a plank in your own eye? And I love this because in many ways it's supposed to be kind of funny and kind of humorous. And, and sometimes we don't think that Jesus would be kind of funny or maybe even a little sarcastic. I know some of you may have tried to give up sarcasm for Lent, uh, my wife, and uh, she's already given up. Uh, she's in the back. You can ask her and I'm going to be in trouble later. But, um, but, you know, maybe even Jesus is kind of riffing with them in this way and, and it's supposed to be a little bit funny because he says to them, you know, why would you even think to do this when you just see this plank in your own eye? Why don't you pay attention to that instead. It's almost as if Jesus knew a little something about us. Because how many of you would say you have the spiritual gift of criticism? You can go ahead and raise your hand. You're in church, so you can't lie, right? But go ahead and raise your hand. I, I, surely I'm not the only one. But sometimes, you know, some of us uh, just come so naturally. As I was watching uh, ice skating in the Olympics and you know, Johnny Ware and, you know, Terry Lipinski come on and, and I hear them say, you know, that was the worst routine I've ever seen in my life. And then I thought, oh, I'm going to like this. And so I begin to watch ice skating and, and I find myself watching there while I'm eating peanut butter and drinking a Dr. Pepper going, oh, I can't believe she went for the quad and she only got a triple. You know, I can't believe as they're jumping together, you know, one wasn't high enough and that they would actually have to touch the ice to keep their balance. When keep in mind, I can't ice skate at all. In fact, one of my worst dates ever involved ice skating. So there's at some point I just gave up and just said, hey, have fun ice skating. I'm done. I'm not ice skating anymore. And in fact, I, I went ice skating just a couple of months ago. And after, you know, holding the sides and going around the whole outside, I thought, you know, can I return my skates and get my money back? I mean, I just can't ice skate. But yet I can be very critical. That I can do. You know, I'm almost like a professional critic. How about you? It's something that just comes so naturally to me. And maybe uh, you've heard some of these phrases from other professional critics, you know, maybe one that's kind of popular in the South, but it maybe starts off with this, you know, oh, bless their hearts. <laughs> bless your heart. You know, maybe, or this one, you know, they are great people, but, you know, that one. Or this one's really one of my favorites. I'm not judging. I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, maybe you kind of have your, your favorite little phrase. But for some reason, you know, being critical is just so natural for so many of us. And, and we even have kind of really kind of eloquent ways that we can talk about it. We can talk about, you know, we, we need to kind of deconstruct this situation a little bit. Or maybe if you've been a part of any kind of performance reviews at the job or you've had to give some performance reviews and you say, you know, I'm going to give some constructive criticism. We try to think of ways that we can really talk about this in more eloquent ways, but really it's the same sort of concept. But see, the reality is, is that most of our tendency to criticize come from really maybe three main places. The first one is, is maybe a place of pride. It's a place when we look at a situation and we just think, you know what, they could do that so much better. You know, maybe we're sitting in a meeting at work and we're just sitting there thinking, you know, I can't believe they're running a meeting this way. You know, there's so many better ways that we could approach this topic. Or maybe you're looking at other people and how they're parenting and you're just like, ice cream for dinner? Don't they realize like that's not anything you should do at all? Or, you know, you hear that crying kid in the grocery store and you're like, I can't believe they can't shut them up. I mean, you know, have you ever had kind of one of those prideful sort of moments? Or maybe sometimes our criticism comes out of a place of insecurity that we have. Insecurities in our own lives. Where really when we're 
seeing all these specks of sawdust in other people's eye, it really is the plank in our own eye. It's really this place of projecting our faults, our failures, our sins onto other people. And really by criticizing that other person, it's a way for us not to deal with those ways that we fall short in our own hearts. And maybe a third place that we find ourselves criticizing is in this place in where we fail to really understand all the information. You know, maybe when we see people making decisions or making choices in their lives and, and really we don't know all the information that's behind that decision and that choice and, and those things that are going on in their lives. And yet we find ourselves saying, you know what, that could be so much better when we have no idea the circumstances or the information or the challenges that other person faces. See, what Jesus is pointing out in this section is this, is that having faults and failures do not disqualify us from following him. It's what, when we fail to recognize our faults and failures in our own lives. It's when we become so fixated on the other people around us that we fail to really see and account for our own hearts. Jesus is saying to us that the challenge for us is that for so many of us is that we live like fault finding and criticism as a religiously and socially accepted practice. And Jesus is saying this is not the way it's supposed to be with us. This is not how we should live our lives. And really, this is the problem with our world. Is that so many of us, really, whether it's through pride or insecurities or, or failing to have all the information that will go and will tear down the foundations of other people's houses. Because in some ways, we feel like it strengthens our own house. And then when the storms of life inevitably come, none of us are able to withstand it at all. This is a problem with our world because our world is broken and we all feel it and we all know it. In many ways, instead of addressing it, we just want to point it out in other people and in other situations. Criticism just happens to be a way of life. I mean, think about it. If you go into your social media accounts and and unless it's, you know, a cat video or something you're eating for dinner, then it's, it's someone criticizing something else or somebody else or some other situation. Or if you turn on the television or you listen to the radio when you're driving into work or, or whatever it might be, and, and, and this whole industry is just based on criticizing each other and, and talking about and getting the latest experts on they can share their opinion on why something isn't working and why that was a wrong decision. And I love sports radio, and this is exactly what it is. You know, that we can all play kind of armchair, you know, general manager, and why did they make that trade and all that. And, but that's what the industry is based on. But what about in our marriages? When our way of relating to our spouse and our partner is to point out the flaws and the things that are wrong? Or what about those times when our parenting strategy has just descended into pointing out the ways that our children aren't measuring up? Or maybe in our work environments, when all the water cooler talk is about why these decisions are made this way and why this is not the right direction or course of action, or maybe even our own inner voices that tell us we're not good enough. And here we go again. And see, I knew you would be this way. This is how you've always been. In Proverbs twelve eighteen, it tells us that the words of the reckless pierce like swords. The words of the reckless pierce us like swords. 
that our words, when we're being reckless, pierce other people like swords. But, and here's the good news, but the words of the wise, those words bring healing. The words of the wise bring healing. So what you and I should be, the way that you and I should interact with other people is that we should be people who seek to be wise and bring words of healing. Because the thing is about wisdom is that, is that wisdom's not like knowledge where we can study knowledge and know the answer for every situation, every outcome, but the wise have to know the right words for every situation. The wise have to know the right things to share at the right time. The wise need to know how they should be in each of those circumstances. And that takes some work and that takes some effort. But it's well worth it when your words can bring healing to a world that's broken, to a world that is pierced, to a marriage that's shaky, to our children who need words of encouragement. The words of the wise bring healing. And the wise know the words to share at the right time. In John chapter 8, there's a story of, of Jesus walking in the temple. And the religious leaders brought this woman before Jesus and, and they have her stand by Jesus and stand before your accusers and they say, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery and they brought her to Jesus in a way to test Jesus. And they said, we bring this woman to you because she was caught in the act of adultery and our law says is that she should be stoned. What do you say? And Jesus seeing her accusers there, bent down in the dirt and he began to write in the dirt. And as the people began to continue to ask them questions, Jesus looked up to them and he says, you that are without sin, you can throw the first stone. Now we don't know what Jesus was writing in the dirt, but I think Jesus was writing the Ten Commandments. That Jesus was writing this, this most basic way that we've said, this is how we are to live in this world. That we are to love our God before all other gods, that we have no idols, that that we're not to use the Lord's name in vain, that we are to honor the Sabbath, that we're to honor our mother and our father, that we should not murder, that we should not steal, that we should not bear false witness, that we should not covet. That this is how we are to live with each other and each of these people were seeing these basic laws and realizing that they too have fallen short and they begin to drop their stones and leave. And Jesus looks at the woman and he says, Woman, where have your accusers gone? Has everyone left? And she said, yes, sir. And Jesus says, I don't accuse you either. Go and sin no more. Jesus, the only person who ever lived, who was absolutely perfect, who kept every letter of the law, who was blameless before God and all people had this opportunity to rightly pass judgment. And yet at this moment, he looked at this woman who was broken this woman who was alone, this woman who was not who she was meant to be. And Jesus offered words of healing to her and says, I don't accuse you either. Go and be who you're meant to be. Go and be fully alive. I don't accuse you. Go and live a life of love and of grace. This is the words of wisdom and of healing. You see, for us, it's not that we, we don't ever offer words of improvement or we don't try to make things better but we always look inside and see what our motivation is. Is our motivation to make ourselves look better? Is our motivation to make ourselves feel better? Is our motivation in some way to tear everyone else down so that we finally feel okay? 
or is our motivation to stand with somebody, to bring healing to another, to say, I am with you? That's the words of the wise who bring healing. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul is writing, he says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. What if we offered words that would build each other up? What if we offered words that would help build these strong foundations so that we could withstand the storms of life? What if we offered wise words of healing that help put the pieces of our lives back together and help us to be who God has called each and every one of us to be? What if in our marriages we said to each other, I love the way that you do this. You know, I love the way that you love each and every one of us. I love the way that you work hard and how you're devoted. What if we as parents said, I love your heart. I love how you try. I love how you keep going. What if we in our our work and our career said, how can I help? What if we took the plank out of our own eyes and helped other people build the foundation and their life that would help them withstand the storm. And in that way, we could say, Jesus, Lord, Lord, we're living the very words you've given us so that we may have the life that you've offered to us and be the picture of the kingdom of God you're calling us to be. Let us do that together. From now on, Let us live by wisdom and not criticism. Will you pray with me? As we come together in this place, we come together from so many different places on our journey. Some of us may be beginning to follow Jesus And maybe we're ready to take a next step in following him more. I want you to know that Jesus is offering you the words of life. The words of grace. That you are accepted. That you are enough. That you have what it takes. That you are perfectly loved. And maybe today you've been following Jesus for years. And you wonder why you keep falling short. And maybe you felt discouraged and that's kept you from taking your next step. Saying yes to God. Jesus is saying to you, follow me. You are forgiven. You are loved. You are restored. Jesus is offering you words that would heal your soul today. Will you open your heart and accept them? God, as we come before you today, we come and lay before you our brokenness. Lay before you those ways that we fall short. Lay before you those ways that, Lord, we have broken other people with our words, with our actions, with the thoughts that are on our hearts. So, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, will you transform our hearts? May they be soft towards you and soft towards others. Lord, may our words be words of hope and encouragement, words of healing. As you restore our broken hearts, as you heal us, as we see your grace that restores us each and every day. So God, may we say yes to you. Say yes to your grace. Say yes to offer words of love and affirmation to other people. Say yes to building other people up. 
so that we would do the things you've called us to do, the things you've empowered us to do, the things we know that we should do. So thank you, God, that you are working through us. And may that transform our families, our communities, our world. From now on, Lord Jesus, we want to follow you. We want to be like you. And we don't want to settle for the way that we've always done things. We want to live by your words, your grace. And we pray this in your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen.